with a very high red flux density. Even if you're not familiar with it, one Jansky in the red band is a very, very high flux. There are not many sources about this level. In fact, there are about 30 PLAX in the whole universe as bright as this in the red band. And uh, the surface density of this PLAX is about one every 1,000 square degrees, okay, over all sky. And this is going back to a paper which one of the first papers I wrote in 1991. So, I know the surface area of the sources, I know the distance between the gamma ray position, the PLAX position and the neutrino, so I can calculate how many, by chance, how many sources of this type I expect within this area. And this is the answer. And I see one. So it's a full sigma result. Just by doing a very simple math. And I have not uh, taken into account two other things. That those 30 year lags with a very high rate of flux density, most of them have a spectral energy distribution which is very different from that of TXS. So only 10% of these have such an SED, so I should multiply this by 0.1, and I have not taken into account the fact that the source was fair. So, to me, the p value that the science paper got is very conservative. If I tell this to Elisa, she said, Well, yes, but you are assuming a posteriori that you know what type of source you are going to get. So, it's, it's a different thing, but just to show you that this is, I think, quite simple. Did you follow it? I mean, it's surface density. Multiply by the area, you, you predict how many sources you expect, you see one, and you get the value uh, uh, automatically. And then there are these two, two, two factors that you look at. So, my feeling is that the value that uh, the science paper published is, 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 is on, the, on the very conservative side. But there's more. Okay, this was one neutrino which was detected in September 2017. Then the ISCO Corporation went back to the archive. And they found this neutrino flare at the end of 2014. By, by flare, I mean that they found that there were about 13 neutrinos coming from the same area within 110 days. This is big news, okay? In one case, we have one neutrino, you have a, a cluster of neutrinos coming from the same area. The p value in this case is again around 3.5 sigma. So basically, this p value now is what's the chance that I see this number of neutrinos above the background. So the question we always get is that why didn't Ice Cube notice this at the end of 2014? And the answer is very simple, the triad correction. Ice Cube keeps doing it. And Ice Cube looks at the sky, divides the sky in cells, and looks for hot spots, as they call it. And instead these are the hot spots, this is the Vivaria. So the bluer and redder you are, the more significant is your hot spot. When you do this for thousands of cells, even if you have a p-value which is significant, the, the trial correction is going to kill you because you have to multiply your p-value by a thousand. So the answer is yes, they did see that there was a significance, but when they did it old sky, the p-value was not significant. If you go back, if you, if now if you know that there is an area which is interesting, and you only look at that area, then your, your post trial correction is going to be much more. And then that's why you get the thing by signal. So the answer is that, Yes, they, was, they noticed that there was something which was not significant once you look at the sky, but then once you know that the area is, is, is interesting based on other input, then you can go back and then you can get this, this big value. Oh, this, was, this was clear. So the big news was, there were two big news. One was this coincidence of the alert with the gamma ray flare. And the other one was finding 30 neutrinos coming from the same region a few years before. So I call the alert one and the flare the other one. Neutrino alert and neutrino flare. Okay, so this is the source. Uh, for those of you who know the constellation, this is Orion. Uh, this is the Orion Nebula, one of the closest star forming regions in the sky. And this is where the blazer, the blazer is. So this is in the northern sky. This is Orion is visible in the winter uh, at our latitude. Our Blazers, I told you yesterday, so just to recap. They come in two families, uh, depending on the spectrum in the optical path. How many of you have looked at optical spectra of sources? Well, so spectra of astronomical sources. Okay, one. Wow, amazing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this, I, I cover this on Friday. This is a spectrum of a quasar. Quasar has uh, been discovered because there's broad, strong lines which come from regions which I tell you on Friday and Saturday. 
So the, the great blessings come in two families. One is the Lux, which goes back to the Lacerte, which was thought to be a variable star in the Lacerte constellation, and this place no light. You can see the difference. While faster quasars, which are the other class of quasars, are quasars, so they are strong. The point is that this TXS is a real luck because the spectrum is like this. So forget about all this. It's an absorption due to the atmosphere of the Earth, and it's an absorption due to uh, stuff uh, between us and in, in the galaxy between the stars. So this spectrum has basically no lines, but it's not true, there are three very weak lines. So, because after the telegram, some people in Padova used the Grand Tecan Telescope, which is a 10 meter telescope in the Canary Islands, and they looked at the source to death. I mean, I, I talked to them, and they pointed the telescope there for hours, hours, and they detected these three very weak lines. Now, why are they interesting? Because they all give you the same redshift. Again, I discussed this on Friday, but uh, objects, uh, Spectra of, of, of objects, extragalactic objects, are shifted because of the expansion of the universe. If you find three lines in the same spectrum with the same redshift, the lines are linear. And the redshift they got was 0.3365, which is not very large for astronomers. For uh, cosmic ray people, it's, it's very large. The, 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 these lines were very, very weak. In astronomy, we classify lines using the equivalent width, which is basically the ratio between the flux of the line and the continuum. Here, lux are characterized by equivalent width of 5 angstrom. This guy has the equivalent width of between 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.17. So, extremely very thin lines, but they are all giving the same ratio, so they are all real. So, we have the ratio, and with the ratio, we get the power of the soil, which is fundamental if you want to do physics. So, the alert comes, uh, the people start, the various corporations start working on this topic, and with Elisa, Paul Jomi, and others, we also started working on this area, and we realized there were some complications. Things were not as simple as they looked. The first one is the following. This is the area seen from Fermi. So this is all of the lab, the excess. And here there is a first quasar, which is a 1.2 degrees uh, away. Now, Fermi, uh, the, period, the point spread function of Fermi, the way that you can actually characterize the photon is not very good. It, it's 95% level is 2.8 degrees, which means that if you have a source here, its photons can go up all the way to here. Or vice versa, if you have a source here, the source could contaminate the position of the, of the data. So this was the first problem. There were two places nearby, they were both gamma ray sources, as I'll show you in a minute, and we didn't know if the gamma ray source, the gamma rays were coming from one or the other. I haven't said it, but if, uh, if you have any questions, please ask me now, and I can repeat and expand on the point, because there's going to be more time today than, than yesterday. So the other point was, as I said, that there were other places in the region which are also valuable in the gamma rays, so the things were not uh, as simple as we thought. Also, there was people were studying the gamma ray activity during the alert, which was the September event, but nobody studied the gamma ray activity of the source during the flare, which was three years before. We didn't know anything about it. And last but not least, uh, we wanted to look at the ACG, the spectral energy distribution. Remember yesterday I said, if the, the source is in neutrino emitters and you're going to have proton photon collision, the flux of the neutrinos and the flux of the gamma rays and the energy have to be within a factor of two. So you have to look at the SCD of the source, plot the neutrino flux and the gamma ray photons, and see if there is a continuity. If there is one, then, it's come, then the source is, is the real one. Nobody had done this before. So with Paolo, John, and Elisa, we started doing this work, and we started from scratch. We took, this is the, the area around the, the neutrino there, and we looked at all the sources in the sky. This is a tool which gives you all the radio sources, next sources around this region. There are 637. We wanted to make no assumptions, okay? Why you made an X-ray? Because we wanted non-thermal sources. If you look in the optical, you're going to get all these stupid stars, which we don't care about. We care about things with jets, laser light, so we want to look at radio and X-ray. When you combine the two, and you look from, for sources which are both radio and X-ray, you're down to seven sources. Four are irrelevant. 
they were just uh, excluded. We were left with three places. <laughs> the TXS in the center, the first place of laser, 1.2 degrees away, and then there was another laser, very close to the generation, number three. We looked at the gamma ray uh, data for all three of them, and we found that only TXS and the first laser were gamma ray sources. This source is not a gamma ray source, at least not seen by Fermi. <coughs> So we are down to two possible culprits for the neutrino emission. TXS and this plasma laser. And this, the rest of the world was trying to assess if we, we, we could be sure 100% that the gamma ray emission was related to the lab and not the laser nearby. By the way, this, this work uh, by uh, collecting all this data is done under Open Universe. I, I, I invite you to, to check this, this page. It's a very nice tool. You go there, you type your coordinates of any position, and you get all the data available in the world in all bands. It's very simple to use. So the idea is this is sponsored by UN, and it's, the idea is to allow even non scientists to access astronomical data. It's a long story, but if you go there, you get all the, the details. Okay, so. There are two culprits. Let's look at the gamma ray data for this source. So, we found periods where both the BLA and the Vesa were strong gamma ray sources. These are, they are called test statistics maps. This contour gives you uh, 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 a probability that this um, source is a gamma ray source and above 30, TS, TS of 30 is 5 sigma. So anything within uh, these uh, contours, we know it's a, it's a real gamma ray source. What you see from here, that there are two strong gamma ray sources about the same level. This was in October 2011. Let's now look at the alert period, September 2017. This is the perspective of laser. Do you see anything there? No. When the alert, when the neutrino came in September, all the gamma ray emission was coming from the BLAC, as the science paper actually uh, uh, was right to assume that there was no contamination from the surface increase. Now, if you look at the flare period, which was the 13 neutrinos coming at the end of October 2014, the situation was very, very different. If you look at energies above 1 GV, most of the gamma ray are coming from the first spectrum equation and very little from the PLR. As you increase the energy now to 2 GV, the PLR starts to become dominant. Once you are above 5 GV, the PLR, the PLR grows. So what is the message? That yes, there was some contamination from the first spectrum equation, but when you look at high energies, remember that when you're looking for neutrino sources, you want the highest gamma energy, gamma ray energies that you want. So high gamma, gamma ray energies, Lab was ruling. This was a, a, an important point which reassured the ice cream collaboration that the PLR was really the source even during the neutrino uh, Then we started light curves. Light curves are, uh, as I showed you earlier, fluxes, gamma ray fluxes, a function of time for the past eight years, and also we started the spectral index. So, 2 means flat in E squared DME, smaller than 2 means hard, and steeper than 2, um, larger than 2 means steep. So, what do you see here? Two things. During the alert, as I showed you earlier, the source was the brightest ever in the gamma ray band. You see there is a spike there. As the flat, as the spectrum was concerned, it was around 2. So, nothing, nothing major. During the, the flare, in 2014, the source was average, flux-wise, it was the hardest ever as a spectrum. So the spectrum was going up, meaning that there are more photons at high energies than the low energy, which is exactly what you expect if you have an event which emits new neutrinos because there are protons producing a gamma rays of high energy. And if you zoom in around the flare, we, we found some here is where I actually, actually get uh, good statistics, and indeed we found that the source was really at the hardest ever during the neutrino flare. Let's look now at the quasar, which is the other uh, possible uh, gamma ray uh, counterpart. So during the alert, as I showed you earlier, the first spectral quasar was 
not doing much, average values, but during the flare, as you can see, it was going crazy. Close to the flare, before and after. So if you zoom in there, the flare was 110 days. As you can see, the temperature of the laser was very bright before and very active after, but not during the flare. So the conclusion is that everything, in, everything taken into account, it looks like there was no contamination from the Fabetto Cuesta, so all the gamma ray emission is due to the interesting one is due to the PLR. It's all clear. So talk. Uh, as I said, we have a relation, so we can plot now the spectral distribution in luminosity. So this is the same as e squared dnd, but now you have power Earth per second. But this shows you where most of the energy of the luminosity is coming from. And there are various uh, um, experiments, so this is the optical V, soft X-rays, hard X-rays, uh, gamma rays, Fermi, and gamma rays from time. So what do you see here? First of all, you see a very strong disavailability system, very strong variability in the gamma rays. This guy was going crazy. And uh, a few other things. This guy is very, very bright. It's in the top 4% of the Fermi catalog. So it's one of the brightest gamma ray sources in the universe. It's in the top 0.3% in the radio band, so it's one of the strongest radio sources in the universe. And it's one of the most powerful BLAX now. If you look at the power, basically there are no other BLAX which have these powers at the peak of the synchrotron or in the gamma rays. So already this is telling us that there's something uh, unusual about this, this object. And if I look at the signal of PV, it's about 115 Hertz. Remember that HPL are defined with signal of PV above this value. So this guy is borderline close to the class of sources which we said should be producing uh, an infinity. If I look at the signal of the, of the, of the quasar, uh, the quasar is more luminous. You look at the value there. This is at the 47 and this is at the 48. But the, the spectrum is a cutoff. Uh, the the lack goes to much higher energies, the first spectrum quasar stops early. So it's not a very high energy source, and so again, it's a much, un, a much uh, a less likely uh, source of neutrino. And these are the two gamma ray phase before and after the neutrino flare. Okay, this is the most important plot of the talk and of the paper. Remember that uh, the smoking gun when you're looking for neutrino sources is the fact that you need the flux of the gamma rays and the neutrinos to be roughly at the same level. So what we did here, we plotted, this is the neutrino flare, and this, are the, this is the spectrum of the source at the same time. So in red you see the, the, the points at the same time. And as I showed you earlier, it's very, very hard. So the gamma rays are going up, and then we have 13 neutrinos, so we can actually uh, start the ECD in much better details. Remember that the ECD that I showed you yesterday, which we use in the LISA to, to gauge if the source could be a neutrino emitter, there was one, one neutrino, so the Poisson error was huge. Here we have 13, so it's much, much better. So, what, what do you see here? You see that the gamma ray is going up and it's pointing straight to the neutrino flux. So this is all consistent with the gamma rays, at least in this region, which we can see, for reason which I'll tell you in a minute, coming from the same process which is producing the neutrino, which is proton uh, photoconductivity. As I said earlier, so uh, you expect, you expect whenever you have uh, this proton photocollision, that the same uh, process produces neutrinos and also the gamma rays. We have the redshift with the neutrino flux. We can actually estimate for the first time the neutrino power of the high energy neutrino source, and we did it, and it turns out to be about 10 to 47 meters per second in this energy range, 32 to 60, 32 TV to 60. The same, uh, the, the gamma ray power in a different region, because remember, we don't get F gamma ray, gamma ray um, uh, data here. 
to each other and the other is much less. But if you extrapolate this there, as you can see, the gamma ray power will be at the same level as the nuclear power, which is exactly what you expect. So this was for the flare, for the, for the 15 neutrinos, 13 neutrinos. For the alert, which was one neutrino, this is the situation. The source was always hard, was very bright, but steam, and we have one event. So, as stated in the s preparation, if you have a number of sources and you expect that overall the, you have a, an expectation of one event, if you're seeing one, the equation value for this event is much less than one. So, this is an upper limit. So, what you can see, you can see that the gamma rays are pointing there within the upper limit, but the error bars are much higher. So, the HD in this case is much more convincing than for the case of the alert in September, because you only have one neutrino. What are the implications? Yeah. Mainly they are very powerful, so this is the, again the, the, this is the most relevant part of, of the talk. The energies we are seeing with the neutrinos in the ice cube are and will always be inaccessible with photons. Which means we are opening a new window of laser physics. Why is that? Because of what I said yesterday. If you have a gamma ray photon coming towards us, it will collide with the infrared, optical, sub millimeter photons that are in the universe, it will get destroyed, it will produce space. So we will never, ever, ever, ever see photons at this end. This is the sky. Sorry, this is the. To put things into perspective, this is the. the my spectrum from the radio to the gamma ray part, I put the ISO facility, I work with ISO, so this is the, the eye. ISO covers the optical infrared. Uh, we also have some sub millimeter facilities. Uh, this is the channel protection of array, CTA, which will be starting uh, soon, close to the ISO. This is the large one in Collider. Neutrinos are up here. We have reached the limits of classical astronomy. This is the sky and the energy seen by ice cube. Do you see anything? No. Oh, because there's nothing to see. <laughs> no, the, we, with photons, we will never be able to see 30 TVs, 1 TV, because these photons are going to be completely absorbed and will collide with the EBM and will produce them. So, it's a momentous time to be an astronomer. And the astronomers can not realize this. Okay, I give talks to astronomers, they look at me like, we reach the limit. We cannot go above this with telescopes. We need other things. We, do, we need multi messenger like ice cream. So I think this is an amazing time. And it's the end of an era and the beginning of, of another. Another implication, which I mentioned yesterday already. If we have a new source, we know that we have, we have high energy protons. So you need to model the STD of this PLAC use not only electron, electrons, but also protons, as we did with Maria. Now, for this source, there is a, 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 a number of papers which are actually modeling the CD of the source using not only electrons, but protons as well. And this has been debated for many, many years. And now, for the first time, we know that we have to use protons in the model. This might not be very obvious to you, but I find it very uh, amazing that we increase the number of material sources in the universe by 50%, going from 2 to 3. The sun, supernova 7a, and the XN0506. Not bad. So, and the other two were stellar sources. This is the first stellar source. And last but not one, last but not one list, uh, this led to cosmic rays. We found at least one cosmic ray source. Um, I remind you what the rays are, for those of you who are not familiar with them, they were discovered by Victor Hess more than a century ago with the balloon flight. They are not rays, they are particles, they are the most energetic particles in the universe. So, this is the energy in E. So, here we have uh, the large one in Collider, here we have CDA, which will reach 300 TVs, Ice Cube, which will reach 3 TVs. Here we are looking, we are talking about 100 extra electron volt, 100 EEVs. So, to see one of these particles, you get about one particle per square, per square kilometer per century. 
in Argentina where Auge is there. So you need a large area to collect it. So huge, huge uh, uh, energies. We don't know where they're coming from, we will just discuss in a minute. Since we know the energy of the neutrinos, we know that there are problems in the source in this planet, at the so-called knee of the cosmic light spectrum. For the first time, we have an idea of what the sources of cosmic rays in this region are. And it's a, it's a place. <coughs> As I said, there are two, um, two main communities, one in Oje, in Argentina, and one in the telescope of the Newton. Problem of cosmic rays is that they are charged. So, you get the list from uh, Auger. The problem is that there is, uh, they are charged, there are magnetic fields in, between galaxies in the galaxy, so these particles get deflected. And the deflection is given by the very simple formula, which depends on the charge, on the energy, so the higher the energy, the smaller the deflection, the distance in the magnetic field. And uh, we don't know this, we don't know this, but the deflections can be degrees. So if you look at the position of the cosmic ray and you try to match with the position of the catalogs of the sources, you might not see anything because the cosmic ray has been shifted by the magnetic field. So it's complicated, but at least in one case now we have we have the source. Okay, what's next? I uh, get asked, okay, now you found one, what are you going to do next? Well the big question is that there are a few thousand HPS in the universe, why the ice cream only, sell, only see this one? So we are working on this, uh, we have a paper which is almost done. Um, we want to find out if and why this source is special, because then we can go back to the ice cream database and look for more. This is the first thing. Another thing we are doing is uh, stacking. If you have a bunch of sources which are very faint, so they are not seen individually. What you do, you, you look, you sum up the signal at the position of your sources, and then you try to get a significant result. So we're doing this with the LISA and the group, uh, not much success so far, but it's a very simple, in theory, method. You just give guys a catalog, they look at the position, they sum up the signal, and then you get the result. As I said yesterday, even if the LACs are little sources, there is plenty of room for other sources, so we are actually investigating, we are very open to other kinds of sources. Ice cube is already there, so it's ice cube is collecting data. Unfortunately, for our, for our uh, wishes, is not very fast, about 15 neutrinos per year, which are of interest to us. So there are many more gamma ray data than neutrino data, unfortunately. We got the SFP, which is partly funding the school, so we can actually. Uh, hire people to work on us on this project and we're also trying to work on the cosmic ray problem as well using lasers as possible uh, sources. So, uh, I'm done. Uh, what's the summary? Um, for the first time in history, we managed to link a, an ice cube high energy neutrino to a source which is a DLR at SF.365. As I hope you understood, the area around the BLAC is complicated in the gamma ray band. We've done a careful study and we ruled out any other possible sources. This is the only gamma ray counterpart of the area. We estimated the luminosity, which is very important for theoretical uh, for theoreticians. You need to know how powerful these things are, and we can give them a value. By showing this, that there is association. Now we know that we have to have protons in a blazer, and this thing has been discussed for 30 years. At least one blazer has to have high energy protons. We've now made an increase of 50% in the number of neutrino sources in the universe from 2 to 3, which is not bad. And we found the first source of protons in blazer. All of this in, in, uh, in, 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 in three papers. And this is an amazing uh, plot, which I'm going to describe to you. I was at the conference in Rome in July, and the guy working on, uh, on the LIGO results showed this plot, which was made by uh, Andy Freeman in Warwick. So immediately he wrote, the, the, he emailed the guy saying, I want this, this plot. So we interacted because the, the energy range is going to be off. Uh, this is the, the corrective version. 
So here you see everything we have so far in the unit. We have the photons up there from the radio to the, to the, to the very end of the gamma ray. In the middle you have thermal emission, black bodies, stars and galaxies. At the edges you have the radio, X-ray and gamma rays, the non-thermal sources, jets, which emit also in the middle, but in the middle, if you look at the sky, you are, you are killed by all these silly stars which emit in the UV band. You have here LIGO, so this is the frequency of the gravitational waves, very, very small. Uh, you have the neutrinos, from small neutrinos to ice cube, so half an MEV to few PV. You have the cosmic rays, all the way to hundreds of meters. I think this is amazing. I mean, this is the, really the beginning of an era until uh, two years ago. We only had, well, we had that, that's two sources here in the interior side. Now, thanks to Nigel Virgo, we have sources here. Here we have, we have data, but we don't have source. Well, we have one source, the extensive of ICO6. So, Making sense of all of this is going to be difficult, but as I said yesterday, the only way to do it is for astronomers working with physicists. There is no other way around. Because, as I said, we don't know the physics, and astronomy is a, is a jungle. It's very hard to navigate. So, I am going to leave you with this. So, no, I'm going to leave you with this first. So, these are the three papers, uh, the two science papers, and our own paper in the notices. There are others, but these are the three most important ones, and I'm going to leave you, leave you with this. Thank you very much. Why, why do we manage to find a counterpart of only one ice cream neutrino? That's the question. Mm -hmm. And one, one reason is that this source happens to be in the region of the sky where ice cream is the most, the most, the most sensitive. Mm -hmm. Ice cube, sensitive ice cream is very strongly dependent on the zinc angle, and this happens to be at the right place. This is number one. As I said also earlier, this source is very bright. There are not many sources as powerful as this one, so this has to play a role. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you more that. 0.3365 in LHC. Don't ask me in yeah, we, yeah, we don't use the capacity, we use LHC. Yeah, 0.3 LHC is not much for astronomers, mm -hmm. uh, but for curving the people, it's, it's about the GCA, the horizon, and all that. So, so many things are coming together in this case. Yes, it could be a chance that they happen to be the most important, the one most powerful the LAX happening to be in the right region of the sky, which is why I still have never seen it. So the fact that the fact that they see on G21, it tells us I think that I still is really the verge of being able to see this guy. So we need to be having the, exactly the right condition. Maybe the flaring was also one, the fact that in the alert the source was very, very hard. So there were many, many gamma ray photons, all these things. And so the point we see we take only one gamma ray so far tells me that ice cream is really, really just a for the sensitivity. It's a cubic kilometer, it's still too small. Correct. <laughs> so it's about 10, 10 cubic kilometers. No, the ice cream gen 2 is going to be twice as sensitive. <laughs> Yes, let me, let me expand on that. So, one possibility, as I, I kept saying that, you know, what you need the gamma ray and the connection. But now, suppose that you have a source where the gamma rays are, the gamma ray region is surrounded by a huge amount of dust, 
and so the gamma rays are, cannot come up. So what you're going to see, you're going to see the neutrino in ice cream, and then you look at the gamma ray sky and you see nothing there. So one possibility is that this could be like orphan gamma ray sources. What could they be? Not lasers, because remember the lasers, the lasers are the jet that pointed towards us, and so if we see the jet, there is not much material there. Remember the AGN model? The dust is all perpendicular around the jet. So if you're seeing the jet here, there is no dust. So maybe jets seen sideways, some things, but this is it's much harder to identify because if they are completely surrounded by dust and you're looking at some of the cutters, you're not see nothing. So it's a possibility, very hard to prove. Um, yeah, so, oh, so, the, okay, from what we know. And can you repeat the question? Yes. Let me show you the picture from yesterday. It's probably easier. So, this is our cartoon of what we think. AGM look like. So we have a black hole in the center. We have some accretion disk. I, I'll expand on this on Friday. An accretion disk, so matter is falling onto the black hole, gets really hot and emits a lot of, of, of material and a lot of energy in the UV. And then we know that there is some dust around it, and we know that the jet is traveling perpendicular to the accretion disk. So if you see the jet, you're looking down, it's what we call the torus, and so you're not obscure. If you're looking sideways, you're going to see the jet much larger on the sky, because when you see face on, the jet is going to become much smaller. You're seeing much larger on the sky, but you're not going to be able to see directly the whole emission there. So this could be uh, one possibility where you have uh, the gamma rays are sort of going in the wrong direction, and the black hole is obscure. This is a poor radio galaxy, but again, uh, I'll expand on this on the final. The question is, why is the jet perpendicular to the actions? Because, it's, because, we think, because we think that the black hole is launching it. And so there is a, there is a, 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 a spe specific uh, direction which is privileged, which is the rotation of the black hole. The black hole is rotating. It. So the jet is yeah, spinning black hole. The details are, to me, at least very obscure. But the idea is that the, the black hole is spinning and then matter is falling and some of it is being thrown out at the relativistic speeds. That's the idea. Yes. So, uh, could there be any hope of being able to estimate the luminosity of a source uh, in the magnetic uh, channel for instance from the neutrino? Because that would be interesting yeah. for instance if you could uh, determine the distance from the luminosity and in the red seam you could make a uh, like yes, but if you don't know the counterpart, how do you know which source you are looking for? Well, if you can identify it. Uh, but if it's totally obscure, how do you identify it? Well, I mean, but for instance, with the example now that you could identify the neutrino and the... Uh, well, there is, uh, thinking about there is there is a possibility. Radio. The radio is... The radio goes to everything. So if you have uh, an neutrino source, which is totally absorbed in the gamma ray, and is a strong radio source, there you can do it. How to get the rest of though, I'm not sure. These lines, right? Which, which lines? Uh, what we show in this... Uh, yeah, but if there is dust, the spectrum is gone. Completely absorbed. You won't see anything in the opposite line. So it's not easy. Because for the power in the rest of the rest you need some sort of emission lines, which are going to be totally absorbed. So, um, I have to think about it, but it looks, it looks hard. More questions, comments? Yeah, one comment. Yes. There's another, there's another source for the neutrinos this year. Another source, another source for the neutrinos this year. It's about, it's about counting the sources. You said there are two sources, the yeah. sun and the supernova, yeah, and the third one, but the Earth itself is also a source. <laughs> 
Okay, well, that's a boring one. What? I can do three dinosaurs. I can do geology. Can you? In principle, of course. In the tree, yeah. Okay. Yes, you do the tree. From the next floor, I don't know what to do. Okay. You know, what is the point? A question to you guys, was this more difficult to follow than yesterday? Yes or no? No, people say no. Yes? People are not strong enough, so it's uh, the one thing we have to learn. Okay. okay. So, before we thank you, uh, don't run away again, because we have an important announcement about the posting session, and then we will take it out, and you can show... Yes? Not the place of the event.
one source. Well, but what it was a life story. Well, that's what I'm not. Well, I can't understand why this source and it's not here. I mean, I suppose it's been there for 10 years now, or more, more than that. Yeah, well, so why is I still detecting? Why, why do we want to find a counterpart of only one ice cream machine? That's the question. Mm -hmm. And one, one reason is that this source happens to be in the region of the sky where ice cream is the most, the most, the most sensitive. Ice cream is difficult to explain from the depending on the zoom angle, and this happens to be at the right place. This is how we As I said also earlier, this source is very bright. There are not many sources as far as this one, so this has to play a role. And I can't tell you that. One, two, three, six, five, and I should not ask the capacity. Yeah, yeah. We don't use the capacity, we use the capacity. Yeah, one, two, three, six, five, yeah, well, is not much for some of us, but for probably the new ones, it's about the engineering of the ice cream. So, so many things are coming together in this case. Yes, it could be a chance that they happen to be the most important one was probably an asset happening to be in the right region of the sky, which is why I think we've never seen it. So the fact that it's only one, it tells us I think that I think is really the verge of being able to see this kind. So we need to be having I mean, exactly the right condition that the frame was also one, the fact that it didn't get hurt, the source was very, very hard. So the way we need in the money photos, all these things. And so the point we see we take only one kind of part so far, that's when the ice cream is really meaning just a for the sensitivity. It's a cubic kilometer, but still too small. Correct. Are you the same for 10 cubic kilometers? No, the ice cream jet will usually be twice as sensitive on the interest of the same. But not in principle, in principle, uh, the problem could be not in the genus, but in gammas, which means that perhaps there are some kind of sources uh, which uh, ice cream is uh, capable to see, but there is not. So this yeah. could be a problem, and ice cream, even in ice cream generation 2, would be not able to detect uh, any, I mean, to identify any source. Yes, let me explain that. So, one, Possibility, as I, I kept saying that you know what you need the gamma ray with your connection. But now suppose that you have a source where the gamma rays are the gamma ray region is surrounded by a huge amount of dust and so the gamma rays are cannot come out. So what you will see, you will see the in ice cream, then you look at the gamma ray sky and you see nothing. So one possibility that this could be like all from gamma ray source. What could they be? Not blazers. Because remember, the blazers, <laughs> the blazers of the jet that points towards us, and so if we see in the jet, there is no mass of the jet. Remember the AGM model. Dust is all perpendicular around the jet, so if we see in the jet, here there is no dust. So, maybe jets see sideways, some things, but this is going to be much harder to identify, because if they have a bit like dust, and you're looking at one of the cars, you're not seeing that. So, it's a possibility, very hard to prove. May I ask a question? Because uh, probably most other physicists study this is, do we know how particles are accelerated in lasers? Mm -hmm. Like, we see that you have jets which are perpendicular to the dust. How do you feel it? How do you have the jets perpendicular to the Yeah, so, well, so, <laughs> okay, from what we know. Can you repeat the question? Yes. Let me show you a picture from yesterday. It's probably easier. <laughs> so this is how like a tool of what we think AGM look like. So we have the cobalt and the center. We have some accretion of this, I have expanded this on Friday. An accretion of this, so matter is thrown into the bowl, gets really hot and emits a lot of, of, of material and a lot of energy in the UV. And then we know there is some dust around it. And we know that the jet is traveling perpendicular to the accretion of this. So if you're seeing the jet, you're looking down, it's what we call the torus, and so you're almost cute. If you're looking sideways, we're going to see the jet much larger on the sky because 
Hoje em dia, fez só, já tem que ficar um passo no lugar. Sim, mais tarde, já buscar, e eu não vou ver o que se dá aqui no meu povo, me chamei. Desculpe, a Wall Possibility, where you have the camera rails are sort of going in the wrong direction, and the black hole is here. It's a cool video box. But again, I just found this on the side. My main question was, why is it just a linear direction? Because it's okay. Because we think that the black hole is launching, and so there is a there is a specific direction which is privileged, which is the rotation of the black hole. Black hole is rotating. So the jetting, yeah, spinning black hole. The details are to me at least very few, but the idea that the black hole is spinning and that matter is falling and something is being thrown out and the matter is spinning. Yes. Yeah. 